uh, we were talking about one of my colleagues, uh, our colleagues, Jim Cornette, a few minutes ago. And there's a million Cornette stories. So I got to tell you, it, it all ties back into my travel difficulties. Um, Cornette and I were flying from, C uh, from Newark, New Jersey to Seattle, Washington. And then we're going to drive from Seattle to Vancouver to do a Monday Night Raw or pay-per-view or something. Corny, was the, he was the wheel man, as always. <clears throat> Much like Vince we're going to talk about later, always the wheel man. So Cornette has this huge, legitimate fear of flying. And it's not funny, but we laugh about it anyway, as we hope you do. <laughs> it's, uh, everybody knows it. It's just there's Cornette's flying stories that are everywhere. So we're going to fly like six hours, I think it is, from uh, New Jersey to uh, Washington state of Washington. So he goes to the bathroom about 20 minutes before we're leaving. He has this routine. And he says, well, I got a little ritual. So I'm thinking, well, maybe he's a, maybe he's a religious guy. Nobody knows about it. He's going to the bathroom to pray or something because he's got to fly. Something weird. That's kind of how I think in my life. Weird. <laughs> so he goes back. And as he comes back, the next few minutes, he starts getting a little more thicker tongued. So being in a wrestling business, you can encounter a lot of guys that talk with thick tongues because a lot of them are high. <laughs> or they, there's medicated peat, you know, self-medicate. Two every four hours? I think it's four every two hours, right? Because I'm a wrestler. <laughs> so Cornette and I are in, this guy we know said, hey, JR, you're going to love this. I put you and Cornette together. I said, you son of a bitch, you. I don't want to sit with him. I thought you guys were friends. We are friends. Do you ever fly with him? No, you don't like to fly. He's scared to death. So he makes his second trip. He made, he made his second trip to the plane. He has everything timed out. The dosage, such and such pill, equals X number of minutes of unconsciousness. The next one equals more unconscious. So he totals it up to where he's got like six hours of being comatose. <laughs> it's all really good until you get on the tarmac and you got an hour and 37 minute delay. <laughs> So this lady says, this lady says, uh, comes to him, comes to me and said, we're in a bulkhead. I'm on the aisle. She's reaching over. She says, uh, I said, no, 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 no. I said, well, we're going to be here, you know, 90 minute delay at least. I want to see if he wanted something to drink or whatever. No, he don't want drink. He don't want anything. <laughs> let him sleep, please. So I told her, I said, look, you got a fear of flying. Just let him sleep as long as you can. It's an hour and a half past. It's a little bit more. So we take off. He's still out. So, oh, God, thank God. So now, I don't know how much you know about United States geography, but about the middle of the country, somewhere thereabouts, is up of the northern part of the, of the United States, is Minnesota. So we fly over, we're flying, I see the little map on the bulkhead little screen, has the, where we are. So we're over in Minnesota, in that neighborhood, South Dakota, that area. And he starts waking up. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Man, it's because he can't do any more pharmaceuticals. I mean, he wanted to live. <laughs> Plus, I knew when we got there, he's driving. <laughs> so I'm damned if I did, and damned if I don't. You know how that goes. So he's so nervous. He's grabbing my arm, and he's, you know, he's, he's sweating profusely. And I'm afraid that the, the uh, flight attendant's going to see him and say, we might need to make an emergency landing. This guy's in bad medical condition. Now, I bet his blood pressure was up the roof, probably 200 over 150 or something stupid. So he says, you got to talk to him, you got to talk to him. So, okay, so now somebody, if you're in a high pressure situation, you want to talk to me, how do you, what do you say? What topic do you use? You repeat the alphabet? And then I said, what do, you, what do I say? What do I, so we're, I'm bullshitting there, and the people are all around us, because he's, he's uh, making kind of a loud, cornet's a little loud sometimes, right? <laughs> God damn it, you got to sing, do anything. <laughs> Hey, these fucking airplanes, I just want to die. I want to die. Oh, we're in an airplane. You don't want to die on an airplane. And they don't want to hear that you want to die on an airplane because they don't know who you are. He said, well, well sing to me. Sing to you. <laughs> you know, anything. I just need to hear, hear you talk and noise and that's so I can calm me down. Like my singing, nobody's ever heard. So anyway, I said, okay, I'll sing to you. So I'm now I'm trying to think, much like the other conversation, what do I say? So now it's like, what do I sing? <laughs> so I had just listened to uh, some music on my little iPod, 
and I had, had come across some Neil Young. I kind of like Neil Young. So I had Neil Young in my head. Because if not, I'd probably listen to the Eagles, and I'd sing Hotel California, which would run everybody from first class back to coach. So now we've got him calm down. He doesn't want to die. No, he doesn't want to die, everybody. He's good. Funny son of a bitch. He's got a hell of a sense of humor, doesn't he? He had you for a minute. So he, I sang. He said, so here I am. Now, the plane is now getting kind of quiet. Hey, who are these two guys up here? It was wrestling people. Jesus Christ. You know how they are. Yeah, you know how we are. So I just sit there, and I said, okay. Uh, so they're all listening. I said, uh, uh, I saw you knocking at my cellar door. <laughs> I'm thinking that was a good lyric. <laughs> you asked me, baby, can I have some more? No, now I said, okay, shit, that's not going to happen. So I think we're, they think we're gay lovers. <laughs> they're thinking my cellar door is something that was supposed to be. <laughs> and that he asked me if he could have some more. Things we go through. So anyway, Cornet, and we then we get to Vancouver, and uh, we cross the border. Get going to Vancouver. We cross the border from the United States to Canada, and there's a the border guys, right? And they they recognized us, but just to be they were in the pictures and autographs and shit. So that's cool. But then Cornet wasn't aware of all that because he was still medicated Pete, <laughs> and he's driving a big old Lincoln. And I'm uh, riding shotgun as best I could, so we stopped there, and they want you know we get out, just shooting the breeze. It's like, can you get out of the car? You know, sure. I didn't even ask them why. What for? God damn it! There <laughs> uh, we go. They're going to jail. I'll be sleeping on my back for the next six months with Big Marge and my cellmate. <laughs> and he, uh, he, they say, uh, we need you to open your trunk. What for? God damn it. We need to go through your equip your bags. And Corny, I don't know what Corny carries on the road in those bags. I really don't want to know. It might have been an inflatable. Don't know. <laughs> it might not have been, but whatever was in there, it wasn't drugs. It wasn't anything contraband like. But he didn't want to go through his bag. So uh then he cuts starts cutting a Jim Corn promo. You done to do right, motherfuckers. <laughs> Now, you think these guys are wearing these guns, they're putting their life on the line, protecting everybody, wants to be heard that they are a Dudley do-right <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> because most people, probably in this room even, are sitting, hey, uh, what's that Dudley do-right shit mean? <laughs> Dudley do-right was a cartoon character. So Google it sometime. But he was an over-characterized uh, Mountie. So they got pissed off at that. So finally... They, just, they pulled me off the side and said, you got to have to calm him down. I said, I can't calm him down. I really can't. He's, he's really, really nervous and flying. We just spent six hours, whatever it was. He said, he's beside himself. He doesn't mean what he's saying. I said, so, uh, but what you guys can do is have some fun with this. <laughs> and at the end, I'll tell the story and make it all good. How are you going to do that? You'll see. Give him some shit. Tell him you're going to lock him up. You're going to handcuff him. Uh, by hands behind his back, and, and you, nobody knows what goes on in our cells because we shut the door, it's very dark in there. <laughs> what are you doing, you motherfuckers? He's, he, it's like he'd have been Barney Fife or some, some cop. He was looking for a gun, and he ain't got no gun. <laughs> so finally, he says, I don't know what I'm going to do. He said, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I said, look, they're just playing with you. They know who you are. They know that you know that they know who you are. Don't you see what they're doing? And he's all foggy from the drugs. Uh, I think I do. <laughs> they're working you. Oh, he loved that. Now he's in, he's in on the rib. He's in the gag. So now they have this nice little back and forth. I bring them together. Hey, let's all shake hands. Had a lot of fun here, guys. You guys pulled it over on us. You got us. 